Actually, when I think of fake it until you make it, I think of folks who aren't necessarily um, skilled in their craft yet, mm -hmm. but they know that they're going to get there. Welcome to New Watermark Photography Podcast, an international offering of Simarca de Agua, a podcast for professionals and enthusiasts to connect and share their stories. I'm Jessica Duque, food photographer and your host. This podcast is brought to you by Sigma, sigmabenelux.com Soho, Brand Studio Whiteybackdrops.com Tether Tools In this episode of the No Watermark Photography Podcast, we are honored to welcome our special guest, Dr. Kimberly Murray. She's a certified mental wellness coach and an accomplished photographer with a unique background in psychology. With her expertise in food, product, and interior photography, Dr. Murray has a keen eye for capturing bright, colorful images with clean lines and minimalist styling. Her deep understanding of psychological principles gives her a unique advantage in creating photographs that authentically reflect the mood and personality of her clients. Join us as we explore the fascinating intersection of psychology and photography with Dr. Kimberly Murray. Discover the advantages of integrating psychological insights into the photography business, learn how to overcome creative barriers, and gain valuable tips for identifying and addressing burnout. This is No Watermark Photography Podcast. Welcome, Dr. Kimberly Murray. Today we have here from Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. Kimberly Murray, a super talented photographer, and now she's going to talk about her new path as a psychologist. Hello, Kimberly. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Jessica? I'm really, really happy to have you here. So, Thank Kimberly, you. what's going on? Uh, what are you doing uh, on these days? Um, these days, I'm actually doing more coaching and less photography, so to speak, and really excited about that venture. Amazing. I remember uh, I met you during the pandemic, like I met you, like I, I never in person. And then I remember this photo of you walking on, on eggshells, like it was yeah. amazing and the use Thank of you. colors. And I'm going to show here the image of Kimberly and okay. it, it was beautiful. And you are a flat lay specialist. You know how to <laughs> handle and how to use color and Uh, other things that I love about you is that you are really generous with information. So if people oh, yeah. ask you, okay, how how can I do this? Then you replied on private messages. And I remember I asked you a couple of questions regarding to the C stand and how to attach the camera to the C stand because you have everything like figured. Other things that I like about you is that you encourage, uh, especially me, how to, you know, how to go out there and how to trust more. And with this, yes. I remember you were saying during a, a symposium, I don't remember what was it, but then you said, I didn't have like 3,000 followers. And I had this event with women and I was planning to teach them photography and I needed a sponsor. And I knocked the door and I said, okay, this is me. This is what I want to do. And yes. And there you go. So you have the, the, your sponsor and then, okay, look at you now. I mean, you're a teacher, you are a psychologist, you are a super professional photographer. I mean, I have so much to thank you. I, you have thank no you. idea the impact of your words in my life and in my career. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if I talk so much. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm excited. Thank you. That was very sweet. Thanks. How did you start in photography and what did you do before photography? So I started in photography in 2009. So my husband bought me my first camera as a <laughs> wedding gift. And I was just really excited about photography kind of as I was planning my wedding and going through different photographers' blogs and just trying to find a wedding photographer and then just loved the 
editorial images that I saw in some of the portfolios, mostly like the getting ready shots, the details. And I said, you know what? I want to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so the day before our honeymoon, my husband reached out to the wedding photographers and asked them like, okay, what kind of camera should I buy? And so bought me my first DSLR. I think it was a Canon Rebel. Okay. Um, probably like an XSI, like the very bottom uh -huh. first entry level camera DSLR. And I took it on the honeymoon. And then from there started photographing children and families. And then ultimately segued into um, commercial photography products, interiors, and food. Throughout the entire time. So even now, I've always had a full-time job alongside photography, Yes. but creatively um, before photography, I was actually a jewelry designer. So Ooh. in New York, I uh, created and sold my own jewelry. And what about now? What are you more focused like lately? Um, so lately I'm, you know, and I feel like I always have these kind of periods of my life where I transition and kind of pivot in some ways. And so I would say now I feel like I'm kind of coming full circle. And so I recently became certified as a professional coach. And so these days I'm focused more on, on coaching and, and launching that, that coaching business. What are the advantages of knowing uh, about psychology in the photography business? How can this help? So I think it really help in a number of ways. I think first and foremost, I mean, relationships are are what are the foundation of kind of client uh, business and, and mm -hmm. photography. And so with psychology, you can really focus on knowing how to build rapport. And then also, I think that understanding kind of what drives consumer buying behavior, mm -hmm. especially like what motivates folks, you know, what do they perceive about a particular product or an image that can help you, I think, also know how to style your image, what props to choose, um, what is the vibe of that image and what it is that you're trying to sell. And yes. so I think knowing about motivation, knowing about perception are, are key things that can work also in terms of photography. So you can incorporate like psychology of color and, you know, this mood of course, yeah. that, that kind of, and, and tell me something. Do yeah. you think this is a good thing? In terms to identify that picky client that is going to make sometimes like, you know, sometimes some clients, they make your life miserable. They, they you know, they say, yes, I, I want this, I want that, but this is my budget. And we have something uh, that we said in the Spanish podcast, like this client, this particular client who, are, who is always asking for a discount is the most picky client. It's always like picking, picking stuff. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so definitely one, the first part that you mentioned in terms of the psychology of color. And then I also think that different gestalt principles or principles of perception that can help you to determine how to kind of compose an image. Yes. And then the 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 clients, challenging clients. Mm, and challenging I think that clients, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Which they may, they may be picky. They might just be particular. You know, a lot of times, even I know myself, I mean, sometimes I, I know what I want and I want what I want, you know, and, and that's not always a bad thing. Although in terms of the, the person that's, you know, the service provider, they, they probably think otherwise. Um, but I think that it does help to know kind of who your client is. And then if you, I think if you market towards the right audience, then hopefully you won't attract clients that are not a good fit. Right. Mm -hmm. And then if you do, I think that it helps to know how to interact with folks and help to kind of have a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be some clients who are picky, um, who perhaps aren't even always or never satisfied with what it is that you deliver. And it's mm -hmm. just in terms of knowing how to kind of maneuver and negotiate that particular relationship. Oh, that's, that's, uh, I, I love what I'm hearing right now. Like, okay. <laughs> I hope you can give us some lessons, some classes. I, I think you're doing that at the moment, right? Like with the coaching. Support so with models. coaching, I'm, so with coaching, I'm, I'm more doing um one-on-one -on -one coaching, which when I mentioned before, it's kind of a full circle moment. So my PhD is actually in clinical psychology. I'm, I feel like I'm going to date myself, but mm -hmm. I've had it for over two decades now. Okay. <laughs> so over 20 years ago, I earned a PhD in clinical psych um, and kind of moved away from that. And so now I'm kind of coming back to working with people one-on-one -on -one and more specifically, really wanting to work with women who are multi-passionate, who are juggling a lot of things. Maybe they have a creative business like photography. Maybe they have another business. 
maybe they have a nine to five motherhood, family mm-hmm. life, hobbies. And it's like, how can you, you know, create harmony in your life and have all those things and not burn out, right? So it's sometimes mm-hmm. you'll hear people say, oh, you have to choose. You have to choose one, stop being so scattered, just pick one and that will simplify your life. But I don't believe that you necessarily have to do that. I think that sure, there might be times when you have to let something go, but maybe it's just that you need to find a way to help them to work better together, do less mm-hmm. of this, more of that. And so that's that's what I'm focused on these days with the coaching. I think I need you in my life. Like, <laughs> <laughs> come on. I'm always like juggling stuff and, you know, multitasking. And 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 sometimes I, okay, well, I had this recommendation, like Jessica, do short list. Because if you make a, like a big list, frustration yes. will come. Yes. And that's so true. That's true. Yes. It's like, what's important now? right? It's like, not all of these things. Okay. And that's, you know, I used to have that tendency to make a laundry list of to do's and I would Mm -hmm. specifically choose my planner. Let me see how many items it will let me put in this planner on this one page. And then I'd have 20, 30 items and it would never get completed. And then I just carry those items to the next day. But it's like, no short list, focus on winning your day. What's important now? W I N. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah. That's that's the the, the key to success. Key to success. To, talking about this harmony, I had this experience in 2020, I guess, I think. Yes. Yes, 2020. And uh, I was super busy, like doing, uh, you know, photo shoot and, you know, my household and everything. So I, I was doing a lot at the same time. And I had a baby and... Um, oh, yeah. My body, you know, shut me down. Like, you know, it said stop. And I got this mm-hmm. uh, vertigo. And it, mm-hmm. I think it was like the most horrible feeling, you know, ever. And then, okay, that was the the, the way my body finds to, to, to communicate. Like, you need to stop. You need yes. to breathe. You need to, you know, like slow down. And, right. and that was, I, I learned that lesson in the hard way. And I think a lot of times, you know, it is sometimes we get to that point where our body tells us what we need because our mind thinks like, oh no, I've got this. You know, I can be strong. I can power through this. I can keep going because I have these goals or, you know, this is just what I do, what I'm used to doing for me. Mm -hmm. And then our body says, no, no, no. You know, you need to slow down. And if you can't figure that out on your own, I'm going to help you figure that out. And then ideally though, we can at some point get to the point where we're preventing that from happening. And we can recognize when we're starting to get to that point that might push us over the edge, right? So that we don't get to the point where our body is telling us like, hey, Mm -hmm. you need to slow down. We're getting headaches, vertigo, as you mentioned, Mm -hmm. stomach, gastrointestinal issues. You know, there are all sorts of ways that our body tells us like, hey, you need to find a different way. Yes. Okay. And can you tell me about mistakes? Because we all make mistakes and um, we all learn from them. And uh, what do you think uh, about how some photographers are conducting their business? What do you think is like, okay, maybe you should do this instead of that. Okay. Things that you have learned that, you know, can help others who are starting in this business. Yes. Yes. Um, In terms of starting, I would say, well, even not even starting because there are folks who have been in this a long time Mm -hmm. who I think are still not pricing appropriately. And maybe this is like the common response in terms of mistakes. But I do think it's a key one because oftentimes we undercharge Mm -hmm. and then that means we have to take on even more projects in order to meet our revenue goals. Taking on more projects, especially at a low price you know, can lead to burnout. And so I'm working, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working because I need to make a certain amount of money. And then maybe I'm even resentful, like I should charge more. I know that I deserve more, but you're afraid to just, you know, charge more. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you're, you're burnt out, you're resentful, perhaps you're not even doing your best work. And so I think that that's one mistake on the business end. Mm -hmm. Um, One thing I learned um, when I was last kind of really in the thick of photography was how to just have better systems. And mm-hmm. I learned that from, you know, I think that you know Finette probably, or yes. maybe, yes. Yes, yes, um, yes. And so she really helped with that because I think that that's also a mistake, kind of doing everything new for each client versus kind of having a workflow that's seamless so that it takes away some of your time. 
Yes. And then I think just on a like photography, the technical aspect, one of the things that I think that I see is, you know, folks are trying to achieve a bright image. And mm -hmm. then what they end up doing is overexposing the image yes. um, in order to achieve that bright look without really thinking about the fact that you still want to have depth, you still want to have contrast, you still want to have these rich, deep tones and the yes. image can look bright. Um, without the entire thing looking bright. So you want to mm -hmm. have perhaps pockets of brightness, but also some shadows. And I know that early on when I was trying to achieve that look, I was like, oh, I've got to get rid of all these shadows because I want it to look bright. I want it to look even. And it just looks so flat. Mm -hmm. And it's like a horrible. And then it's interesting though, because, you know, even as I say that, I'm thinking that it also could be your style, yeah. right? So it's like, some people, that's just the look that they're actually going for. And so for me, I'm like, oh, that's overexposed. Yeah. Um, but for them, it's like, oh, no, that's just my style. And so I think that we have to be careful when we say that something's technically incorrect, when it could just be stylistic. What do you think are the creativity killers? Mm. I've known a lot of people with OCDs, and I think that's definitely uh, a creative, uh, you know, creativity killer. So, you know, I think in terms of creativity killers, I would say one is fear mm -hmm. and anxiety, right? Fear of failure and being too concerned about what other people will think of your work. And that's where I'm going with the fear. So if you're afraid that I'm going to put this out there, people aren't going to like it. Um, people may think that I'm not as talented, then you, you know, especially if you're thinking about experimenting with something new and you're not sure if it's going to hit the mark then you might think, you know what, let me just stay in the safe zone. Let me just keep doing what I've been doing and mm -hmm. not kind of step out on the ledge because I'm not sure how it's going to be perceived. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a big one. I think, you know, you hear about it all the time, comparison for sure. Yes. Um, because then you're looking at what this other person's doing. They're successful. They're getting a lot of positive feedback, perhaps mm -hmm. online. Maybe I need to shift my approach to doing what they're doing, because that's what seems to be what's popular, what sells, what people like, what people yeah. think is beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not to not to get on Instagram <laughs> and knock Instagram, but I think that, you know, that's a surefire way to kill your creativity too, is to spend too much time studying other people's images and work, especially because sometimes we'll do that for inspiration, right? We'll say like, okay, let me go and look at other photographers' work to inspire my own. Mm -hmm. And then you end up, I think, subconsciously, a lot of times mirroring what they're doing and yes. not kind of doing your own thing and following your own vision. Yes. And I believe, uh, well, that uh, Annie Lebovitz said that uh, when you are thinking too much in the technical you are not making photos. So you are basically killing the mm. creative part when mm -hmm. you are, you know, like thinking, okay, exposure, you know, aperture, yeah. this, that. So it, it doesn't flow. It doesn't go, you know, in, in the way that you're supposed to show your art. So, yes, no, I think that that's, that's so true. And, and I think that that's one of the reasons why it's important to get those things under your belt first. Mm -hmm. And then once you kind of know all the technical aspects of photography, you you understand lighting, then you're not fiddling during a shoot. You're not kind of interrupting your flow as you're like taking, you know, different frames and capturing the image and then looking and saying, oh, this isn't right. Okay, let me tweak this light here. Let me, you know, change mm -hmm. this over here. And then you've interrupted kind of that creative flow, like you're no longer in the zone. So for sure, I think that it's important to make sure that you have that under your belt first, all the technical aspects mm -hmm. before you can really just go into your whole creative vibe. Right. And mindset. Yeah. What is the most effective way to boost your creativity? Because we know already how we can kill the creativity, but how yeah. can we boost it? I think one way to boost it is just to, well, for starters, to not feel the pressure to always create. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that we need to do sometimes is just to take a break and step back. I know that there have been times when I felt like, okay, I need to come up with something new. I need to come up with something new. And then I get so in my head about it that I can't do it. And so I'm like, okay, let me take a walk. Let me just clear my head and take a break. And that's one way. I think um, another way to kind of boost creativity is to go on creative dates. Um, mm -hmm. I think Twyla Tharp mentioned that in her book. I think it's probably in the artist way. And to just kind of go different places 
Maybe it's the museum. Maybe yes. it's just walking around town, looking at different architecture. Maybe it's just walking around town and noticing the different colors that are around you or going in your backyard or listening to the sounds of nature or listening to music. Like I love, love yes. listening to music. So going, but whatever you do to go on a creative date. And I would say to go alone because then I think a lot of times when we take people with us, you know, sometimes we're uncomfortable going places by ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we want to invite our friend, we want to invite our spouse. But then I think what can happen is that, especially if you take a museum, for example, we might be pulled away from what we're drawn to, to what they're drawn to. They might say like, hey, come over here, look at this piece. And then you're no longer focused on what mm -hmm. drew your eye and what was inspiring you. And so now you're kind of in there, <laughs> in their space. Um, so I think that, and then another thing I would say is really kind of limiting your choices. So putting some parameters around a project. Yes. So for example, when I think of myself and I think of, you know, starting a new project, even if it's writing, if it's creating a, a new photograph, and if it's just a completely blank slate, that can be overwhelming. It can be exciting because you can mm -hmm. create anything. And then it can be like, oh, my goodness, I can create anything. I, I can't figure out where to start and what, what's going to be amazing. But if I knew, if somebody said, here, here's this backdrop, backdrop mm -hmm. or surface. Here are some props. This is your color story. Come up with as many ideas as you can to create something out of these three elements, or out of these two elements. And then you kind of have some parameters on the work. And then you can just like let your mind go wild because you can think of, okay, I can maybe use this backdrop, but then this lighting. Okay, maybe I can use these props and tell this story. And so I think that if you have some parameters around the project, then it's not so vast mm -hmm. that you can't even, you know, begin to know where to start. You know what happened to me, to be honest? Uh, yeah. <laughs> when I have time, normally I have, okay, I have that, I have deadlines, but when okay. I have like so much time, I yes. don't create. I just mm -hmm. feel creative like two days, you know, two days before the deadline, like, bing, right. bing, you know, <laughs> it is like I need to be under pressure and yes. that is awful. I, sh I should enjoy to have all this time to, you know, to, to enjoy the process, not to rush it. And right. normally what I feel is like when I have all this time, it, you know, I'm not happy with the results. I'm more, mm -hmm. I, I'm more happy when I have like the, the necessity, the need to create quickly, yes. quickly grab everything. Da, 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 da. Right. Yeah. No, I work better under pressure myself, actually. <laughs> I do. Oh my, I'm not alone. I'm, I'm happy. No, you're not alone at all. <laughs> I'm not alone. <laughs> For all the audience, what is a burnout, basically? How can you identify you are having one? Yes. Um, so burnout um, typically has three features. So one is this extreme exhaustion. Mm -hmm. Another is this kind of cynicism towards your work and distancing from your work. So maybe you're procrastinating. Um, and then another tends to be lack of achievement or feelings of lack of achievement, right? So, you know, I'm I'm not doing a good job at this thing anymore, or perhaps I can't think of any creative ideas. And so it usually centers around those three key uh, domains and you know oftentimes I think the first sign is that people just feel exhausted you know you feel tired you feel drained you feel like you don't have any creative ideas mm -hmm. um, you find that you're dreading the work even work that might seem exciting to you mm -hmm. and you know I know for example and then there are some of the physical symptoms as well that we talked about some of you might have headaches you might have other bodily symptoms that tell you that hey you need this break and it's typically a result of just kind of prolonged stress or, or work. And that's why I mentioned before, like this pricing too low, because then if you're working so hard to make the money, then at some point you may burn out and you may get stressed and you may feel like, you know what, I'm working so hard, I'm not seeing the payoff, or mm -hmm. I feel like the payoff's not going to come soon enough. Um, and for me, I know that at one point in the past, I knew I was burning out when I kept getting inquiries, which was, you know, should be exciting. Yes. Oh my goodness. People are emailing me. They're saying that they want to work with me. And I was like, oh, somebody else is emailing me. Somebody else, you know, woe is me, right? Somebody else wants to work with me, yes. which seems so ungrateful. And, you know, I was like, I feel ungrateful that I'm not excited that somebody's reaching out and saying, hey, love your work, want to work with you, are you available? And I just kept turning them, turning down every inquiry that came through. And I was thinking like, 
somebody else would love, love this problem, this problem yes. that I'm having right now. And I knew for sure at that point, you know what, I'm just, I'm, I'm burned out. <laughs> I, I, I need a, I need a break. Yeah. And what is your recommendation if you are feeling, you know, in this situation? What what should what should I do? For for sure, take a break. I think um, that's the key thing is to take a break. And I would say to also during that break to unplug, um, unplug from social media for yes. sure because I think that that can help you to feel like you need to get back in it. So sometimes if you're like, okay, let me take a break, but I'm going to still scroll social media, then you're seeing all these other people producing, 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 and then you're thinking, okay, I need to get back out there. I need to produce so that I'm not forgotten or for whatever. Um, people, you know, used to call it, I don't know if they still do hustle culture, but you can kind of get sucked back into that lifestyle mm -hmm. if you haven't taken a sufficient break. And then you can also just connect or reconnect with family, with friends who you may not have had an opportunity to connect with while you were so deep in the work, but now that you're taking this purposeful break, you have the time to connect or to reconnect with something that you used to love doing, you know, a hobby that's totally, if we're talking about photography and photographers, that's totally disconnected from yes. photography. Yes. And, and one of the things that I would recommend folks not do, you know, if they're burning out, sometimes we think like, oh, I just want to do this creative project or create this image, you know, that I've been wanting to create during this break. Mm -hmm. But I think that sometimes that can, you know, keep you in that cycle of burnout because you might during that period feel like, okay, I've been wanting to create this. It needs to be amazing. I need to like pull it off during whatever break time I've set for myself. And it can start to feel like work, you know, as opposed to a true break. So I like to recommend folks do something totally, you know, outside of what their work is. Well, I, I have to say that I love taking breaks, not because I okay. have or had a, a burnout, but right. um, I do enjoy to, you know, to just not touching the camera for a week and doing yeah. something else. I don't want to, you know, like be, you know, like a producer. I, and I had a season in my life and I think many of the uh, of the audience, they, they, they have the same feeling as me or they went into, into the same situation. Like we were like just producing, producing, producing. And at some point you are not creating, you are just yeah. like taking photos for a restaurant and they are right. all the same and they are not, mm -hmm. you know, special. And, and when I do these breaks, I come, you know, like fully recharged and okay, let's yes. do it. Yes. Yes. I mean, at some point we can feel like we're just on autopilot. Let me just crank this out. It, it's come so easy. You're not thinking of any creative ideas. This is the, the process that works. So I'm just going to just break this out and just do this. So yes, you can definitely just be on autopilot after a while. And time-wise, uh, how many yeah. months, days, weeks, years are mm -hmm. like, you know, like enough to recover from a burnout? You know, I don't think it, I think it varies. Um, it varies, I think, by person and depending on how burned out you feel and whether you're really taking care of yourself during that period that you're taking the break. So for some people, it might they might just need a couple of weeks. Other people might need a month or two or maybe. And I think that we don't need to feel so um, compelled to necessarily, unless, of course, you have a client project that has a date, a due date, yes. but to stick to what we said. Like if I say, oh, I'm going to take a two week break. And then at the end of that two weeks, I'm still feeling like, oh, I'm not ready to get back in it. Don't get back in it. Unless, of course, you need to because there is a project that has a looming deadline. Yes. So at least take your time, no matter what, you know, clients are going to be there. You know, you are first. This is right. uh, what I believe. Yes. It's a good advice totally. to you. Me okay, too. let's talk about personality, the personality okay. of the artists, of the photographers. Okay. Um, what do you think about the ego as a success driver? I had a, a guest in the Spanish podcast that he said the ego is um is the motivation, is 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 you know, it's like I want to compete, I want to be here. It is it is like part of the art, it's part of the artist. What mm. what is your opinion about the ego? So I think that, and, and this is me from my, my background in psychology, I, th I think of the ego as just our sense of self and sense of self-esteem. And I think that a lot of times 
when we hear people talk about, oh, this person has a big ego, a lot of times we're thinking of somebody, at least here in the States, we're thinking of someone who seems conceited or they seem cocky or they seem full of themselves. And it could really just mean that they have a healthy sense of self and they have a strong self-esteem. And I think that that, you know, can be very um, key to key to success. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's it's especially important for success as a photographer because, you know, photography is so subjective. And so you have to have a strong sense of self-esteem to know that, you know what, I may love what I created. Other people may not love it. They may not see the beauty in it. They may not think that it's so unique. Yes. And that's okay. And I think that if you really accept that, that it's okay if everyone doesn't love my my stuff and thinks I'm the cat's meow, so to speak, then that can help you to keep going, right? And yes. keep producing and keep trying new ideas. And then I think that once you really just keep at it, keep at it, and especially if you do believe internally, I'm great, then I think that you'll move in that way. Mm -hmm. And then you ultimately will find success. I mean, I think it's, it's totally a mindset for sure. You have yes. to believe that you're worthy. You have to believe that your work is great. Yes. You have to believe that even if you're not getting a lot of likes, even if clients are not knocking down your door, you still are a great artist. And then mm -hmm. that helps you to keep going. And then that helps you to move, you know, and have mm -hmm. a little bit of swag maybe and feel like you are a great artist. And then I think people are drawn to that. I think that people are drawn to, people who feel confident and then they start to believe in your confidence in some ways. And then I think that that can lead to, to success. So I do think that having um, a strong sense of self and self-esteem does indeed help with success. Self-love. Self-love. <laughs> yes. Always. And, and this versus the fake it until you make it. Mm -hmm. So what do you, what, what, what is the difference? I think that's a good, a good question. I don't know. See, when I think of fake it until you make it, I think of folks who aren't necessarily um, skilled in their craft yet, mm -hmm. but they know that they're going to get there. And so, you know, you're kind of just going along until you have your big break or you have your big moment and you are kind of, to me, that's like a, a false confidence when I hear fake it until you make it. Yes. You know, because sometimes you don't believe that you're that great, but you're like, I'm going to fake it. I'm going to put on this front until I actually am better, until I am great. And then other people will see that versus when I think about the first question we were talking about ego, I think of people who actually do believe that they are good at what they do. So they're not faking this feeling of confidence. They actually do feel confident. Yes. And it's based on something too. You yes. know, it's based on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so there is something uh, that I've been uh, always like pissed and, you know, uh, okay. about this expression. Okay. Jack yeah. of all trades of master mm -hmm. of, of known. I hate it. I hate it because I believe that um, they are so uh, gener uh, photographers, like generalist photographers, that they are so good in every, you know, aspect of photography. I mean, they can yeah. be good at newborn. They can be great as food photographers. And, you know, I hated it when I uh, when I heard the first time the expression, like, you have to be good at one thing. And mm -hmm. that's it. So, yes, it's it's interesting because I actually did an Instagram post on that. I don't know if you saw it um a while back but yes I was excited when I learned the full phrase you know because yes. all growing up all I heard was jack of all trades master of none but then the full phrase is but oftentimes better than a master of one and so it is sometimes beneficial to be skilled in different areas right and I feel like I feel like it's important in terms of business to know a little bit about everything even if you do ultimately outsource some things because maybe that's not in your zone of genius mm -hmm. because you need to know if what people are delivering is is on point you know if it's yeah. good if it's what you need and so I think you need to learn a little bit about everything but I also think that being good at different things means that you can transfer some of those skills into other areas so yes. I'm, I'm all for you know doing multiple things being a bit of a generalist I I, I would say that that's probably what I lean towards. And then sure, you might be more skilled in one area or you might focus more on one area, yes. but I don't think that there's anything wrong with, yes. with doing multiple things. Yes. In some uh, 
in the Spanish podcast, we had Kimberly Spinell, uh, The Little Plantation. Uh, oh. She did the interview in Spanish and oh. she uh, recommended a book I'm going to mention here. Yes. And it's about this, like how can you, you know, take great things from different areas and bring it into yours and make it like even more powerful. <laughs> so, and let's talk about the imposter syndrome. Um, I was actually recently reading um, an article in the APA, the American Psychological Association, and it said that up to 82% of people, you know, experience this imposter phenomenon. And so it's very common to feel like, you know, I'm faking, like I'm, I don't really fit in here um, and that I'm not good enough. I mean, people believe that I'm good enough and I'm a professional, but I feel like I'm not as good as other people think I am. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you oftentimes have this anxiety and this fear of being found out. You know, mm -hmm. if I do something at some point, I'm going to make that one mistake that's going to let people know I'm not really as good as, you know, they think I am. Yes. And that's going to perhaps ruin, you know, ruin my reputation, ruin my business, whatever. And so a lot of people have this, um, this imposter syndrome. Yes, yes. yes phenomenon yes. as the ABA calls it. Yeah. Yes. I had uh, Vanessa Joy on the second, uh, on the first season. Okay. And then I asked her about this imposter syndrome. And then she said, I feel it every single day, even with uh, her experience, with all mm. these years, with all, you know, she said, I feel it every day. Like, I cannot believe you. I mean, that is, that is like, what? <laughs> yes. No. I mean, I think it's very common. I know I felt it a lot with um, photography. I was like, you know what? I prefer to create in my home studio where I can kind of experiment at times. And if, if I don't get it right, right away, I can fiddle with my lights. I can, you know, fiddle with other things, tweak the styling. And I don't have to worry about somebody seeing that I didn't get it brilliantly the first time around. And I was thinking, yes. I don't want to be on set necessarily with all these other people who then are going to be looking at me and expecting me to nail it right away, which isn't even the case. I mean, I think people still have to experiment and change their lighting scenarios mm -hmm. on set, on a big set sometimes. But in my head, I was thinking, no, because then people are going to look at me and see that I don't know everything. And I need to come across as being the expert who knows everything. And so I think that we all probably to some extent have some degree of this imposter phenomenon, even if we don't, even if we don't admit it, I think that most people probably do. And apparently 82% of folks do. To oh. some <laughs> Let's talk about social media and how uh, can this mask, you know, the true reality of uh, some people? I would say that it's not just social media. I would say that this happens also in our real lives, right? And mm. so With social media, though, I think that if you're lucky, if you're a business person, especially um, on social media, then you've worked hard to build a brand. Yes. This is if folks are following you and they know who you are. So you've built this brand. People are following you for a specific reason. You are known for something. You've created this brand or this image that's very memorable. And then you probably feel the pressure yes. to keep up that persona and to keep up that, that image that people expect from you. And that can be, I think, lonely at times because then mm -hmm. you feel like I can only show up when I'm in that space and I can only show up as that person. And then sometimes that's not even who you fully are. You know, like you have so many different aspects of yourself. You've chosen to show one side, perhaps on social media. You may even want to show other sides of yourself, but then you're feeling like, okay, well, that's off brand. Yeah. Okay. So, and then sometimes you feel that pressure. You know, when I talked about burning out and talked about unplugging, sometimes even if you're scrolling, you're like, okay, I should be posting three times a week. I should be posting however often. So I need to show up. And mm -hmm. I need to show up as this person. And I think that that can be stressful um, for a lot of people. Well, I decided, you know, like to keep my personal life private. I share sometimes a little bit that I have a family, you know, I'm not a bot. Yeah. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> that's, that's important. And uh, sometimes, you know, I show my face like once in a while, but not like, you know, hey, for all the who are asking where I've been. No, no, no. I'm not. That's not my personality, to be honest. But yeah. um, I, I believe like uh, boundaries are really important like uh, these days. And to me, 
I believe social media or let's see, um, I have something here. I have this. This is a reminder. It is like offline mm -hmm. is the new yes. luxury. Yes. <laughs> so this is this is like my mantra. Mm, I love it. So you know, the, the other thing that I, I, I just started thinking about in terms of social media, and it might be off topic, off topic, not sure, but yes. I think that with social media too, you can get lulled into thinking that you're closer to people than you actually are, right? So sometimes it's like, okay, I'm commenting, I'm going back and forth perhaps with this person. Yes. I'm friends with them and they don't view you the same. You know, let's no. like, no, we're just acquaintances. We, we just know each other on Instagram. I wouldn't yes. even call us Insta friends. You know, we're no. just... I just comment on your stuff. You might comment on mine. Yes. And sometimes, you know, especially if we don't have a strong network in real life, you know, that can, you know, be a blow to us if we then realize like, okay, this person isn't reciprocating this online Insta friend, Insta friend who I thought was an Insta friend isn't reciprocating in the way that I want or the way that I need. And so I think that that can also be, you know, harmful or hurtful to, yes. to some people too, especially yeah. if they don't have a network outside in real life. Yeah. But the thing is like during the pandemic, we had like more time to, to be part of a community and right. when the pandemic was over, uh, you know, life goes on, continue, you know, and then yeah. it is not the same. Also, because, you know, the Instagram and the algorithm and the changes are yes. you know, making the people like feeling, you know, down because the numbers, the numbers, the numbers. So I, I have to say that I have a few friends, like real friends that I connect with them and I talk to them and, you know, like, okay, we call each other and they are like, you know, like nice colleagues, not many, just a few of them, but you know, you are, I'm, I'm really selective with, with, with my friendships in, in right. real life yeah. and on Insta. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that there's nothing wrong about it right okay and let's talk about photography because okay. you are a master in color in flat lace interior everything you do Thank is you. beautiful and what are your favorite tools your go-to gear are you still taking photos I I am minimally um interestingly enough um yes. but yes I do I do still have all my gear and know which are my my favorites and my go-to yes um so I would say for for flat lays especially I love my c-stand that would mm -hmm. be my go-to tool um, and ultimately you can have, and I have one, um, a tripod with a horizontal arm. Yes. I prefer the piano you know? yes. and a leveling cube, uh, which is just that small yellow cube that you put in your hot shoe of your camera. Yes. And that can help you to ensure that your camera is in fact directly overhead your mm -hmm. shot. And then in terms of lenses for flat lays, I love the 50 millimeter. That would be probably my favorite, although... I started to really love the 85 and 100 millimeter macro for, yes. for flat lace as well. At one point, I purchased a 35 millimeter. This was when I was doing portrait photography. Yes. And then purchased that 35 millimeter, never used it. Um, well, maybe used it once. And I was like, oh, this is not my, this is not my style. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not feeling it. Um, and so, and I don't like it either for, for flat lays because it can distort the image. Yes. So those would be my favorites for flat lays. And then mm -hmm. for interiors, which I also shoot a lot of and love. Yes. I would again say um, not the C-stamp, but a tripod. Um, tripod, the leveling cube still, because you want to make sure that your verticals are straight with interiors. And so like the walls are straight. They're not kind of slanted and looking wonky. Yes. And then... My favorite lens for interiors would be a 24 millimeter tilt shift, which also helps to minimize distortion and is great if you're trying to get a full room shot. And then also the 50, I use the 35 there for vignettes, or if I want to just take a picture of say a wall or a specific area of the room mm -hmm. and then 85 for, for uh, details. Yes. And then to some extent, if there is a room with like a lot of great texture, I was once photographing a home that had this kind of really cool texture on the wall, but then mm -hmm. also had these kind of cords hanging. So I brought in and used my 100 millimeter macro for that, but just to take a really close up yes. of the texture on, on the wall. So 
those would be my go-to. So what's the same across both is that leveling cube and then C-stand tripod, something yes. that levels and stabilizes um, the camera for you so that you don't have to go handheld all the time. This course about flat lace. Can you tell us about it a little bit? Yes, flat lay play. So flat lay play teaches you everything you want to know about flat lay photography from styling the image to photographing the image, troubleshooting, um, any challenges that might come up along the way. Um, of course, I focus on principles of perception as well as kind of composition principles. We talk about backgrounds and props, equipment and tools, their styling demos, tethering, and also how to capture images with both your DSLR and your iPhones. Well, not iPhone, your camera phone, I should say, because yeah. not everyone's iPhone. <laughs> your camera phone. <laughs> and so camera phone tips as well as DSLR tips. So, and there's also a little bit about color theory as well. So there's there's a lot, a, a lot that's packed into that course. Let's talk about inspiration and mentors. So, and it's interesting. So I, I'll talk more about inspiration, I think. Because uh -huh. um lately I'm really inspired by video okay. and just love, love, love video. So one is a woman named Jalen Little yes. who photographs, she's a photographer and a recipe creator, but more yeah. so now focused on video than stills. And she always does these amazing reels where she's just kind of creating a cocktail and doing this really cool reel that makes me want to live that lifestyle. Like I don't even drink alcohol mm -hmm. um, really. And so, but I'm like, I want to be grown and sexy. I want, I want to come home after work and <laughs> <laughs> and create a cocktail. So it just inspires me to um, at least think of different ways that I might make yes. a mocktail and feel fancy. Um, I also love another woman, um, Lola. Okay. And she's a content creator. She's not even a photographer, like a professional photographer, but her videos are just amazing. I mean, like the storytelling is beautiful. The way she photographs it or shoots the, the different motions just amazing the mm -hmm. way she pulls it all together, edits, selects the music. I mean, the whole thing is, and she does a lot with, um, with fragrances actually, but okay. it's just, I mean, so beautifully done that I'm always just going to her page just because I'm like, I want these like soothing, really well done short form videos. And then lastly, I would say that I will forever be inspired by Ali Vidal, who mm -hmm. is a director and a filmmaker who, you know, I think she's just the epitome of beautiful, emotive storytelling through motion. So if you're not familiar with her work, I would say go check out her website and then you'll just be blown away and go down the rabbit hole <laughs> of looking at all of her films. Um, and, and it's interesting because Ali, she, back in the day, she used to um, speak at this photography conference that I used to attend. And I was like, I want to learn how to do films like this. And still, I would think that if I were to do something next and feel like I could be good at it, which is a creativity killer to, as I'm saying this, uh -huh. because you shouldn't just do things that you think you'd be good at, because then, you know, you can still enjoy things even if you're not good at it. But anyways, <laughs> if I were to do something <laughs> else it would probably be like filmmaking and learning how to really do video well and make sure that I'm telling a story in this really captivating way. And it's like Ali who like Ali who like really inspired me to want to do that. And I just need to at some point in my life go down that path. It's amazing because you you answered my last question. I mean, okay. what's that next photo that you haven't made yet? So it is about video. So that this is something really cool. So that is your next adventure. I believe mean, you're gonna would, be great yes. at that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I would love to. I would love to do video um, next. There has been an image that's always been stuck in my mind that I want to yeah. create. Um, you don't know, say, and it's don't say. around. <laughs> don't say, I, don't I'm say. not gonna. No, 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 no. Um, yes, I, I will keep that under wraps and maybe you will see it. Yes. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> That's amazing. For sure, um, I would love to do video at some point. <laughs> yes, that will be awesome. So Kimberly, yeah. to close this, do you want to say something to the audience of uh, No Watermark Photography Podcast about, you know, 
how to be a better photographer, a good photographer, and how to deal with, you know, with the day and the situations and clients? Um, I would say, you know, one of the things to be a good photographer is just to learn your craft and trust yourself. And and I want to go back also to imposter syndrome, because I think that even as photographers, that that sometimes holds us back. It holds us back from pursuing the next opportunity or from saying yes to an amazing opportunity that comes our way because we feel like, oh, I'm not ready. I'm not good enough. And so I would say to help to combat that feeling, that imposter syndrome, to make a list of your achievements. And then that can help to invalidate those feelings that you're not ready, that you're not skilled enough, that you haven't done enough to get to Mm -hmm. this point. Like make a list. And then often too, you might get DMs or kudos, you know, and then what do you do with that? Or comments on your on your images when you post on Instagram or wherever. And to make a folder of those kudos so that you can always go back to them yes. to reflect on like, you know what, this person had this to say, not that we should worry about what other people think, but sometimes that can help be a boost to help us to know that, no, we really are good enough. We really are skilled enough, because I think that that is one of the things that holds photographers back from getting to the next level is that fear, that fear yes. of failure, that imposter sh- syndrome. And I think that really needing to combat that in order to to really achieve success so in a, in a few words it's like if you feel fear do it even with fear but do it yes totally yes <laughs> of course <laughs> do it with fear for sure thank you so much Kimberly I'm so glad um, to have you here and please remind us your uh, social media handles Yes. So um, on Instagram, I am at K Murray photo, K-M-U-R-R-A-Y-P-H-O-T-O. On LinkedIn, I'm Dr. Kimberly Murray. And yeah, you can find me at KimberlyMurray.com. And uh, later this year at DrKimberlyMurray.com as well for coaching. Amazing. I can't wait to check out your page. So I'm so happy, Kimberly. Thank you so much for being here. And I wish you you a great day. See you in the next one. Bye. Bye for now. Bye. (laughs)